So good afternoon. I am so glad that you all are here with me today. We are going to take a journey back to Jamestown, Virginia. So that is the site of our first permanent English settlement. And my question to you is this. Who remembers something about Jamestown when you were a kid and you learned about Jamestown in school? Anything? What did you, what do you remember? Yes, they have recreated it. So a lot of people have visited there as an adult, but does anyone remember anything from your childhood history class? Probably not. And that's what everybody says. Twice this week I have had two people say the same thing. 1607, that's all they know. <laughs> but they're right. So people don't remember or were probably never taught the history of Jamestown and our first English settlement. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Now there was actually another settlement prior to Jamestown that did not survive. 20 years before Jamestown was founded, we had another colony from England come to what is now the Outer Banks of North Carolina. They settled on Roanoke Island. They were on Roanoke Island for three years, from 1587 to 1590. And then when the supply ship returned to bring more food and supplies to them, they were gone. They had disappeared. And we call them the lost colony. <clears throat> now, they didn't know they were lost. You know, we gave them that title. But the lost colony has remained a mystery for 400 years. And there have been all sorts of theories from A to Z, literally A to Z, from they were abducted by aliens to they were abducted by zombies. <laughs> I'm serious. So over the past 400 years, archaeologists and historians keep working and they keep digging and they keep looking for clues. And I'm not going to go into much of it because I'm working on a program about the lost colony, but I'll let you know they've been found. So we do know what happened to them. But they did not survive the first permanent English settlement. So we have to jump ahead to Jamestown, 1607. And in 1607, 104 men and boys will sail across the ocean to the New World. Now if we could scroll up, I'm not sure what the next picture is here. So that's perfect. So 104 men and boys leave England in December of 1606. They are on three ships. The Susan Constant, which was the largest and captained by Christopher Newport. He was the leader of the whole event. And the Susan, the Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery. <clears throat> now on board was this gentleman. We probably remember his name. You know, that's people will say, oh yeah, I remember here learning about him in school. I personally do not like Captain John Smith. I have my reasons. But he was on board the Susan Constant. And then en route, he was accused of plotting mutiny. So Christopher Newport has him thrown in the ship's brig. And Christopher Newport says, when we get to the West Indies for some, you know, just to supplies, pick up some supplies, when we get to the West Indies, I'm gonna have him hanged. Well, they get to the West Indies and the Anglican minister steps in and says, don't hang him, just, just let, it, let it go. And Newport says, okay, I won't hang him here, but when we get to Virginia, I'm gonna hang him. <laughs> now, Virginia at the time had been named by the lost colony. When they came to Roanoke Island, they named the land Virginia for the virgin, unmarried Queen Elizabeth I. And at the time, Florida had been settled, today's Florida had been settled by the Spanish. So basically everything from Georgia to Maine was Virginia at that point. So they head on over, they land in Virginia, and they land on what is now Cape Henry at Virginia Beach. And they put a cross into the sand and they claim the land for King James. Then they opened the secret orders. You see, there were secret orders that were not supposed to be opened until they stepped foot onto Virginia soil. 
and that would tell them what they were supposed to do and it would name the eight members of the governing body of the colony. No one knew who the leaders of the colony were going to be. So they open up the orders and it says three things. They are to go up a river and to find a place that is a deep water port that is defensible from the Spanish. So they will look for that. They will also look for a way to get to the Northwest Passage because at the time we didn't know that America stopped and there was another ocean on the other side. So that was the second point. The third is my favorite. They were to not offend the naturals, the Native Americans. So they were not to offend. And in fact, the orders said, take great care to not offend the naturals. Well, that isn't going to work. <laughs> because we do a real good job doing exactly what was, they were told not to. So then the list is read. The eight men who are going to govern the colony. Now remember, Christopher Newport's going to have him hanged as soon as he can. Except, guess who's on the list? Captain John Smith and Christopher Newport cannot very well hang someone that the king appointed to lead the colony. <laughs> so he is spared. <laughs> so they sail up a river that they name the James and they find a location that they will name Jamestown. Now can we see what is on the next slide because I'm not sure what I did. Okay, so not yet. <laughs> Sorry. So there are more pictures on the board this time. Um, so when we're finished, maybe you can get a picture of that board. So they clear land and they build the fort. And as they are building the fort and clearing their land, they are exploring. They're going on up the James River and they go as far as they can to what is now Richmond, Virginia, where they hit the falls of the James and they can go no further. They also explore down and they explore all of the little rivers that were attached to the James River. And wherever they went, they encountered the naturals who were always watching. Now, one thing that they did not know when they landed here in the spring of 1607 was that Virginia was in the midst, about halfway through, of the worst drought in 770 years. And tree rings, if we study dendrochronology, which is the study of tree rings, we know that. So it was the worst drought in almost 800 years and nothing would grow and no rain was falling from the sky. So the dirt was just hard baked dirt and with no rain falling, the James River was extremely salty. They had no idea of this like we would know today. So now they are here, they have cleared the land, they've built the fort. They had supplies on board, but water in barrels is going to run out. And then they thought they would collect rainwater, but that didn't happen. And they thought they could plant gardens, but that didn't happen. So by the time we get to the end of 1607, they land in May, we get to December, only 38 of the 104 had survived. So things didn't look good for Jamestown. But in 1608, Another supply ship will arrive. There will be more settlers. There will be food and supplies and water. And things look a little bit better in 1608. So that's just an introduction. Now we'll move on to question one, number one. <laughs> All right, go ahead and read that for me. Was anything being manufactured in Jamestown? So she is asked, was anything being manufactured in Jamestown? So as soon as they came, they cleared the land and built the fort, the next order of business, other than exploring, was to establish industries and manufacturing capabilities, something that would benefit England. So the first thing that they tried in 1608 was glass blowing. And if you go to Jamestown today, you can still see them blowing glass. They have a glass blowing facility there and you can see how they were doing this. Now, England had sent men from Germany and Poland over to specifically make glass, to be the glass blowers. So they set up this shop to do so, but it really wasn't that successful. 
they weren't producing enough glass that it was going to matter over in England, so that instead of having to import glass, they could just get it from Virginia. So then they said, we'll plant flax. Flax can produce linen fabric and linseed oil. So we'll produce flax, we'll grow flax, except we're in the middle of this drought and flax isn't going to grow. Nothing is growing, but flax needs very rich, wonderful soil to grow in. And this was just hard caked dirt. So flax didn't work. So then they said, we'll try beer making. Now you could do one of three types of beers. You could make beer, lager, or ale. Beer was difficult to maintain at a temperature that had to be maintained at a very high temperature. So it was hard to maintain that. So they didn't want to do beer. They didn't want to do lager because lager was a very low temperature to maintain. But ale was right in the middle. Much easier to maintain a middle of the road type of temperature. So they were going to make ale, except that wasn't very successful. Then they said, we will get silkworms from the Orient because Virginia has many, many mulberry trees growing. They grew wild and silkworms eat mulberry leaves and then you can spin the silk. And if they could do that, then England would never have to import silk from the Orient ever again. So they had silkworms shipped over. And then of course they let them go to do their little thing, except there was just one problem. The mulberry leaves in Virginia are a different type of mulberry tree than the ones in the Orient. <laughs> and the silkworms didn't like them, so they wouldn't eat them. So that didn't work. <laughs> they also tried lumber. Lumber was something that they could clear the forests here and ship all of that lumber back. But one, it was very expensive to ship back. And two, clearing fields was not taking care to not offend the naturals. Because by them chopping down all the trees, they were taking Native American hunting grounds. So lumber didn't work. They tried ironworks, they tried salt works. They tried wine, they brought Frenchmen over. Of course, the grapes wouldn't really grow. And they tried the one sort of semi-successful manufacturing adventure was fur trading. They had found a, a wide variety of furry animals in Virginia, particularly beaver. So they were in the fur trading business and it was sort of successful, but never successful enough to take off like it did in other places. So basically, everything they tried failed until 1610. And we're going to come back to more about tobacco. But in 1610, tobacco will enter the picture, and that will be the gold that supplies the money for England. So those were some of the manufacturing capabilities. Number two. What happened? So what happened in 1622? So you can see here, the natives are watching what is going on here as they're building the fort here in this top picture. So by the time we get to the late teens, the late 16 teens, relations with the natives were very poor. First of all, they had come in and cleared the land. Now they had taken their hunting grounds as well as buffers that the natives used to buffer in between villages. So they had taken important land that wasn't theirs and now nothing would grow on it because they had taken the land and we were still in the midst of this drought. They had also brought something with them from England that would affect the native population. Disease, particularly smallpox. And hundreds of natives had passed due to smallpox. And their Indian medicines, you know, they had their medicine men. It did nothing for these English diseases. So that had been a problem. At one point, the English had decided, well, we'll make really good friends with the, the natives and we'll invite them to live with us. 
and we'll give them good English houses and they can work in the fields like we are going to work and we'll build schools and we'll colonize and Christianize all of the little native children and we'll take their culture away from them. And the natives knew Chief Powhatan was the chief at the time. He knew that this was cultural suicide. So that offer really was not something that they were going to take up. So the relationship had been deteriorating. But then in 1614, something positive happens that sort of cements the two cultures together. And that is when Chief Powhatan's daughter, Pocahontas, marries the Englishman John Rolfe. So now they have formed this union and this peace between the natives and the English. Now, that won't last very long because in 1617, Pocahontas will die. And she dies over in England. They had gone to England, they had gotten back on the boat, they were sailing back here. She died shortly after they left they went back to England and that's where she is buried today. So her body never even came home. And by this point in time, now Powhatan had been replaced. He had been replaced with his younger brother, Chief Opakan Canoe. Opakan Canoe was younger, Powhatan was very old, he wasn't well, so they had removed him from power. And Opakan Canoe had no interest in being friends with the English. So Pocahontas dies, and now that is off, and then in 1618, Powhatan dies. So Opakan Canoe cannot even honor Powhatan's wishes for peace as long as he's living, but now he's dead. So Opakan Canoe takes over full force, and you know, for him, I'm sure if he could have spoke English the way we would speak today, he would say, all bets are off. So now the relations will not improve over the next couple of years. And in 1622, Opakan Canoe decides that he is going to take care of the English in his land. And so by the time we get to 1622, the settlement had spread out. Jamestown was 1607, but by the time we get into 1610 and 1611, we have more outposts up and down the James River. By the time we get to 1620, we have more communities from Richmond all the way down to Hampton. So now we have a number of settlements, and there are about 1,200 Virginians total. On the morning of Mar in March of 1622, Opakan Canoe and his mighty warriors had all gone to visit people in these villages all of these settlements. And so the natives were just mingling about. It was probably a, hey, how you doing this morning? Glad to see you. Well, then at a certain time, they turned on the English and massacred them. Some of those settlements were completely wiped out. There was nothing left. Some had some survivors, but when it was all said and done, 347 English had been killed, which was about a third of the population. Now the English were the ones on the war path. And they, this would trigger what was called the Second Powhatan War for the next 10 years. And it would be the English attacking, and then the natives would attack back. And this would go back and forth for 10 years. But in all in all, 10 years later, the English had killed hundreds more natives than were killed in any of the massacres that the natives had triggered or you know, had instigated. So the English basically avenged, as they said, the death of those 347 by the hundreds. These wars will go on until 1644. There will be another massacre in 1644. And then in 1646, Chief Opakan Canoe will be captured. And that, this is one of the massacres. This is a, a depiction of it from a book during that morning in 1622. So in 1646, 
Opecon Canoe is captured by the English. He is taken to Jamestown. He is put in the jail in Jamestown. And while he had his back to the guard, his, the guard shot him in the back. So that would be the end of the difficulties with the natives because by the time we get to the 1640s, we've pushed them all westward. So things will change. Now on that fateful day in 1622, Jamestown had been spared. It was the one settlement that hadn't been attacked. And when I was growing up in Virginia, I was taught about the boy named Chanko. There was a young native boy who was about 14 named Chanko, and he lived with an English family. The head of the family was a man named Richard Pace. He lived with them and supposedly loved them very much. And on that morning in 1622, the story that I was taught was that Opakan Canoe had told Chanko to murder the family. But he loved them so much he just couldn't do it and instead <laughs> warned them. Richard Pace lived across the river from the fort. He got in his rowboat, rose across the James River, warns Jamestown they're prepared and so they are spared. That's the story I grew up with. That is not a true story. And as we dig, literally in the ground and through records that surface, we find new pieces of information. Chanko was actually a courier to Opakan Canoe. And Opakan Canoe had told him to warn Richard Pace, not kill him, to warn him to go across to Jamestown. The whole plan was for Jamestown to be spared. And it was basically Opakan Canoe saying, I know you're here, I know we can't get rid of you because more of you just keep coming, but you stay in your lane and we'll stay in ours. And so all of those other outlying <coughs> settlements had been you know, massacred, but Jamestown was spared and he was saying, this is your land, that's our land. But it didn't work out that way after all. So that is the story of the 1622 massacre. Number three. What is the story of indentured servants and slaves? So what is the story of indentured servants and slaves? By the time tobacco takes off and it starts to grow, now the English who are in Jamestown have to plant this stuff and they have to tend to it. And these were wealthy gentlemen who really were not used to doing work such as that. And growing tobacco is not easy. And it's, not a, it's a long, laborious process. And it starts where you clear the land in December, and then in January you plant the seeds, and you tend to them through January, February, March. They start to grow in the spring. You keep tending to them. And then in the late summer, early fall, that is when you can harvest the tobacco. It then has to be hung up in tobacco barns to dry, and then it has to be put into barrels, loaded on ships, and sent to England. And by now it's the fall and the whole process starts over in December. Now you can say, well, you can just plant it where it grew last time. You can't do that. Because tobacco completely leaches every nutrient the soil has, and th that soil is no good to plant anything else. So they needed more land. So they needed more land and they needed more people to cultivate it. Now meanwhile over in England, they had just finished the Thirty Years War, the economy was bad, and this seemed to be an answer with the government. We will send the poor who cannot get work here in England over to America as indentured servants. And so what that meant was that if you can't pay your own way over to America for a hope, you know, and a hope and a dream, the only way you can get to America is go as an indentured servant. And you would get on a ship, and then you would set sail. When you got to Virginia, then someone would purchase you, basically, for seven years. The first thing that person will do is pay the ship's captain for bringing you over. So he's been paid to bring you over, and now you are my servant for the next seven years. 
I will provide food, shelter, and clothing for you. And then at the end of seven years, you will be free to go. I will give you three barrels of corn, a new set of clothes, and initially, they got a little piece of land. So this seemed like the answer to leave England. Many indentured servants came over and they died in the first six months because the life was harsh here. So indentured servants come over and now they are working the tobacco fields, but in seven years, now I'm stuck again. I have to get more indentured servants. And as time was going on, the economy was, in, it was improving in England and now people over there are saying, I don't want to go to America. There are natives there, there's bad water, you know, I, I, don't, I can just get a job here. So there were less and less indentured servants coming. Now, as they were not being given land, only uh, initially for a very short time, now you had all of these indentured servants too that had been free after seven years and they had no place to live. So they either had to work as tenant farmers or sharecroppers, or most of them pushed westward toward the Appalachian Mountains. And many of these indentured servants were Scots-Irish. And they push westward and eventually come down the mountains into North and South Carolina. So that was the only place that they had land. But now you're stuck. You're trying to grow tobacco and you have no one to do it. Well, the Portuguese enter the picture. Spain and Portugal had been enslaving Africans for hundreds of years. England was just a little late to the party. So Spain and Portugal had been involved in slave trade for hundreds of years. They would go into Africa, capture these men and women, and then take them some places in Europe and also bring them here to what was called New Spain. New Spain is what we now know as Mexico. So in the, <clears throat> pardon me, in the Gulf of Mexico, there is a Portuguese ship with 300 Africans on board. But also in the Gulf of Mexico are two English ships. Now, they were privateers. Do you know what a privateer is? If you don't, I know I can ask you the next question and you do know what it is. Do you know what a pirate is? Yes, we all know what pirates are. Privateers were legal pirates. That's what they were. They were sanctioned by the king in England to do their piratey thing, just bring home some sort of resource for us in England. So they were just legal pirates. And these two ships are there. They attack the Portuguese ship and they steal 60 Africans off of that ship. 40 of them are put on one ship and sent to the West Indies, and 20 are put on that second ship, and they are brought to Virginia. 1619 will be when the first Africans step onto American soil, and they will, that will start our history of slavery. Now, initially, they were letting them go after seven years. They came as indentured servants. But more and more tobacco is growing because by this time, the drought is over. They want to grow more tobacco. It is what is making them money. So they need more land. They need more Africans to work the land. And so after just a few years, the indentured part of it ended and slavery becomes how it will remain in our country. So now we will keep bringing in slaves with the slave triangle, the slave trade triangle of Africa, the Bermuda, pardon me, in Virginia, <clears throat> pardon me. And so now we are involved in slave trade as well. Now eventually we get to 1807 and the United States government will say no more incoming slaves. We're going to abolish any new slaves being brought in but it did not abolish slavery in our country. It just meant that the slave trade was over. Well, now what are you going to do if you have, you know, we are now cemented into an agrarian economy with slave labor. What are you going to do if you can't buy new slaves? So the answer was to make a rule 
a law, so to speak. And that was the status of the mother is the status of the child. So if an enslaved woman had a child, that child was property to that master automatically. And this is why you often read and hear the horror stories of masters raping their slave women over and over because they were deliberately getting them pregnant so that they would have more slaves. This was the answer to keeping slavery going. And we would keep it going until 1865 when the Civil War was over and then once and for all slavery was abolished in this country. But that is the story of the arrival of the Africans and the history of our, our early history of slavery. Number four. When did women and children arrive in Jamestown? So when did women and children arrive in Jamestown? So officially, not for several years after its founding, but initially, two women did come over in 1609. They came initially in 1607, and then in 1608, more men came, and in 1609, two women arrived. One was a wife to a man, and she had brought her servant with her, and her servant's name was Anne. Now, the woman herself, Mrs. Mrs. Burris, she, we don't know what happened to her. We don't ever find her on another record. We don't think that she lived very long after she got here. But her servant married a man named John Layden. And we have documentation on them. It was the first English marriage here in, in America. And they will have four children. They will leave the Jamestown area. They will go down to what is now Hampton, Virginia. And we have records and documentation for them. So those were the first two women. But they were not the ones to come here and to help establish the colony. Now, as time goes on, many of the men in those early years were saying, I'm just, we're, I'm going back to England. <laughs> I don't want to stay here anymore. And so England saw that they needed to create permanence. And the way to create permanence is to have wives and children. So they were going to bring women over. Now, I am going to read to you the view of women in the 1600s. I know, this is what everybody does. Hmm. <laughs> women are considered physically and mentally weak. Women have difficulty controlling their passions. And it is a woman's duty to attach herself to a husband who will govern her with his superior wisdom and strength. <laughs> well, ladies, what do we think of that? See, now I had a... She, I had a lady the other day and she just went yeah. <laughs> So this was the view of women. Now women over in England, they had heard all about America. They weren't real keen on coming here either. And England knew that, so they offered an incentive package. If you go over, we'll give you things. We'll give you land. Women could not own land in England. So they're going to give them a little piece of land and we'll build you a little house on that land and we'll give you clothes and we'll give you food and now you can have your pick of the men. Now the ratio was like six to one. So for every one woman, there were six men to choose from. And England said you can take as long as you would like. Just choose a husband. I say it's the 17th century version of the bachelorette. <laughs> they were just waiting for that rose. <laughs> so the first load of women will come over in 1620. There were 90 of them. The second load will come over in 1621. There were 56 of them. And once they chose a husband, then he would pay their passage. He would reimburse their passage over with tobacco, because by this time, tobacco is the cash crop. And so for that reason, the women were called tobacco wives. So if you ever hear the term a tobacco wife, that's why they were called that. And now this will establish permanence, and they will start their families. 
Now, having a family in the 1600s was not easy, in the 1700s either. And in fact, when you had a woman had a baby, there was only a 50% 50, 50 chance that they would live to see their first birthday. So baby, the infant mortality was very high. So if you got to your first birthday, then it drops to 25% before you reach your fifth birthday. But if you get to five, you're doing pretty good. <laughs> you've pretty much survived the horrors of early childhood. But by the time a child was 13 years old, they had all lost one or both of their parents. So there were blended families, like we have blended families today, nothing like this. So let's say, let's say you're a gentleman. <laughs> you and I get married, we have five children, and now I lose you, you pass away, and I've got five children, but now I'm gonna marry you, and you've lost your wife, and you had five children. So now we've got 10, and we might have two more. So now there's 12. Now let's say I pass away. You've got 12 children. You really need a mother for 12 children. So you might find her, and she's got three or four, and you can see how families were very blended and everyone was related. Uh, so that's what the, the, the families were like for these children and the families in general. Now, one story that I do like to share about a woman who does not meet the criteria of being physically and, and mentally weak is the woman named Sarah Harrison. She's one of my favorite stories out of early Virginia history. No one knows who she is. I know who she is, and I find her fascinating because Sarah Harrison was betrothed to marry a man named William Roscoe and she had signed the contract. You see, you signed a contract back then. Yes, I will marry you. And once you signed that contract, the marriage hadn't taken place, but that's who you were going to marry. And because of that, one third of all colonial brides were actually with child by the time the marriage ceremony took place, because that's who they were going to marry anyway. So she was betrothed to William Roscoe, and then she met Oh, James Blair. <laughs> and she really liked James Blair much better. So she decided she was just going to dump William Roscoe and she was going to marry James. And her parents said, you can't do that. And she said, watch me. <laughs> and so she did. But during the marriage ceremony, the minister said, Sarah, do you promise to obey? And she said, no obey. <laughs> and the minister said, Sarah, do you promise to obey? And she said, no, obey. And he asked her a third time, do you promise to obey? And she said, no, obey. And he just kept on going at that point. He wasn't going to ask her again because she was not going to obey. Now, they had a long, happy life together, but then there's poor old William Roscoe. He was dumped by Sarah. But you know what? I'm really glad he was dumped by her. And I'll tell you why I'm glad she dumped him. Because he ended up marrying another woman. And then they had children. And finally, one of those children marries a man with the last name Cole. Because William Roscoe and the, the second one were my sixth great grandparents. So if it wasn't for Sarah dumping William, I would not be here talking to you today. My name would not be Vanessa Cole. <laughs> so I'm glad she dumped him. <laughs> Number five. What was the starving time? So what was the starving time? The starving time was perhaps the most bleak time of Jamestown's history. Now, this drought that we were in the midst of when they arrived in 1607, it was still going. Men were dying as, you know, just as fast as new shipments could come in, it seemed like, because nothing would grow. This is one of the reasons why I don't care for Captain John Smith. He said that all the men were lazy and he ordered them to work, and if you didn't work, you didn't eat. Well, they were malnourished and starving, and nothing would grow. You can't work the ground if nothing will grow. So it had just kept getting worse. 
1608, there was a fire in Jamestown and all of Jamestown burned. So that was a, a difficult time in 1608, just the year afterward. By the time we get to 1609, there's hardly anyone left in Jamestown and it still hasn't rained. So England sends a fleet of ships over to Jamestown with people, livestock, water, food, supplies, and they set sail early in the spring of 1609 and they hit a hurricane. Well, when they ran into the hurricane not far from Bermuda, several things happened. First, some of the ships went down. They were lost at sea. The largest ship was called the Sea Venture and it shipwrecked on Bermuda. One ship did manage to limp its way to Jamestown. There were just a few people left in Jamestown at this point, and now we have a whole new shipload of people arriving, and now there were 300 people in the colony. But they brought no food, because the ships with the food had gone down. So now you have 300 people and no food. And the relations with the natives had deteriorated so that whenever they opened up the gate, to go out and forage for food, the arrows flew at them. So they couldn't leave the fort. So now you have 300 people holed up inside of that fort. It's not raining and they have no food. And they started eating anything that they could. Rats, mice, snakes, lizards, bugs, whatever they could. They even ate their shoe leather. And it was now going into winter. So this was the late fall and it was getting cold, and they needed warmth. So they tore down every building in Jamestown to use for firewood. They couldn't go down, they couldn't go out and chop down trees because the natives would shoot them. So they burned the, the village, you know, inside completely down. They burn all of the buildings, they have no food, and they were just dying daily, and they were being buried inside the fort and some of them, when there was no longer any room in the fort, in the middle of the night when the natives were asleep, they would sneak out, dig a shallow grave, and bury them just outside the fort. By the time we get to the spring of 1610, the population inside the fort had gone from 300 in the fall of 1609 to 60 in the spring of 1610. 80% of the colony had died. Now, at this time, with 80% of them dying, they didn't realize that the sea venture over in Bermuda, or out in Bermuda, had taken all of their shipwrecked wood, and they had built two new smaller ships. They named them the Patience and the Deliverance. And now those who had been shipwrecked on Bermuda for a year were going to come to Jamestown. So they come to Jamestown and they look at the situation and the leader of the Sea Venture, these two smaller boats, but we'll call it the Sea Venture, the leader says, this colony can't last. We're just going back to England. So he loaded up the 60 survivors on the two ships with everyone else because they hadn't brought food either. They had just come in from Bermuda. They didn't have food. And they are going to leave and go back to England. It was a failure. So they're sailing down the James River. But coming up the James River is another fleet of ships. And on the ship that is leading the way is Lord Delaware. That's where we get the state of Delaware. Lord Delaware was being sent over with a fleet of ships with livestock, food, water, supplies, more people. And he told the other two ships to turn around. We're going to go back and we're going to rebuild. So they turn around and go back to Jamestown. And then a miracle happened. It rained. So the drought was now over. So now we have food, we have people, we can plant things once again. The drought is over. And what really saves the colony in all of this is one of the men who had been shipwrecked on Bermuda. His name was John Rolfe, the one who marries Pocahontas. 
and he had brought something from Bermuda with him, tobacco seeds. And this is how tobacco will enter Virginia and the colony will be saved. Now they always suspected that during the starving time that they had also turned to cannibalism. That was something that they always had thought that had happened, but they never had any proof of that. But that is the story of the starving time. Number six. Who was Jane? So who was Jane? Now remember I said they always suspected that cannibalism had taken place. Jamestown has an ongoing archaeological dig. They have their own archaeologists there, and they are constantly digging. And they have plenty of places to dig. We used to think that most of that fort had eroded into the river, and so they didn't think there was a whole lot to find because they thought of the erosion, there was just nothing left. But we now know only one small corner of the fort actually eroded into the river. So the whole fort was intact under the dirt. So they're always digging and when they finish at that site, then they fill it up and they go to another place in Jamestown and dig again. Back in 2012, they were digging and they found, is there anything else below that? No, okay, you can just go back to her. So I have a picture up here. There is an archeologist in a grave and they found bodies as they were digging. And these would have been some of the bodies that had died during the starving time, and they had been buried in the fort. So they found bodies. That didn't surprise them. But then as they were digging, they found a trash pit. Trash pits are wonderful. I used to love digging in a trash pit when I was working in archaeology in Virginia because you can tell a lot about people from their trash. You know, I mean, if someone goes through my trash, they're going to know that I use Crest toothpaste. They're going to know that I eat pizza. They're going to know that I eat strawberries and blueberries because that's in my trash. So when you find a trash pit, it's really cool. Well, in this trash pit, they found trash, which was oyster shells, broken plates, things like that. But they found the bones of a dog and a horse. And the dog and the horse had been professionally butchered. And there is a way that when you butcher an animal, you have to do it a certain way. You don't just kill the animal and then just start to chop it up. When you are butchering an animal, it's done a certain way with a certain you know, type of, of knife and the, you get the meat off. So they found that the bones showed evidence of being butchered. That didn't surprise them either. That just meant that they ate the dog and the horse. No, su no surprise there. But this was something else they found. And this is part of a skull. And this is part of the jaw. And when they got those out, and now you can scroll up, and they put it together, they brought in scientists, forensic scientists from the Smithsonian. They clean up the bones. Did any of you ever watch Bones on TV? If you never watched Bones, she was a forensic scientist. She did this kind of work. And so they brought people from the Smithsonian who took those bones and put them back together, which is a very difficult puzzle to make. But they built them, and then they tested the bones, and what they found was that this was a female. She was about 14 years old, and she was not wealthy. And the reason they know she was not wealthy is because the wealthy drank and ate from pewter plates and vessels. And that leaves lead in your bones. She had no lead in her bones. So she drank and ate from wooden plates and cups, which meant she was of a lower class. So they reconstructed her face based on the markers from her skull, and they named her Jane. So Jane was the proof that cannibalism did take place. They didn't kill you to eat you, but if you had died, it was the only hope that there was. So that's who Jane was. Number seven. How did Jamestown grow after leaving the fort? So how did Jamestown grow after leaving the fort? So by the time we get to the 1620s, Jamestown is a big bustling seaport city. 
and it was outside of the fort. It had spread out along the waterfront. It was the incoming and outgoing port, and there were taverns, and there were businesses. There was all sorts of activity going on in Jamestown, and the land had been cleared, and they were building homes. But as Jamestown grew and developed, they also had made a road out of Jamestown called the Great Road, and it led up the peninsula. Jamestown sits at the bottom of a peninsula. The James River is on one side, the York River is on the other. So the Great Road led out because communities were spreading out now. They had not only spread up and down the peninsula, but they were spreading inland. So the Virginia colony was growing and some things happened over the next decades. One of which, because we know that Jamestown burned early on in 1608, then in the starving time they burned it for firewood. In the 1670s, a man named Nathaniel Bacon held an uprising. We're not gonna go into him, but he burned Jamestown in his uprising. And then, in 1698, Jamestown burns for the fourth time. And by the time we get to 1698, Jamestown burns again. Jamestown is not the only port, for over on the York River on the other side, Yorktown has been established. And York has a big port for ships to come into. So after Jamestown burns for the fourth time, they decide, you know what? Things are growing toward that, you know, the mainland and the main part of the peninsula it's time to move the capital. And so they decide in 1699 to take the capital of Jamestown, or capital of Virginia, out of Jamestown. They will head up the Great Road, and they will pick a little place that sits right in the middle of the peninsula, right in the middle in between the two rivers, up on a high ridge, and they had named it Middle Plantation. And they said this was the growing place to be. This is the place, it's between Jamestown and Yorktown. Everyone can get to Middle Plantation much easier. We'll make that the new capital city. And so in 1699, Middle Plantation becomes the new capital, but they change the name. They change the name to Williamsburg. So now Williamsburg will remain the capital until the Revolutionary War era, when it will switch one more time to Richmond, where the capital is today. So those are the stories of our journey to Jamestown, and I hope you've learned something today. <laughs> Thank you. Now I do have some songs. We have a few minutes to sing a couple of songs, just the lights can come back on. And I will say this, try to find documentation for songs that were sung in the 1600s in Virginia. <laughs> You're not going to find it. <laughs> so I had a really difficult time trying to decide what to sing with you all. But where there's no documentation for songs being sung in Jamestown, there is documentation of songs that were being sung in England. And if songs are being sung in the 1600s in England, when English come here, they're bringing that, those songs with them. So I do know what songs were being sung in England, which were most likely being sung here as well. So I picked two. You may not know the second one. I'm finding that some people do, but most people don't. The first one, though, was the one that I found most interesting. The first one is based on truth, historical truth. I had no clue. I just thought it was a dark little strange song when I was a little girl, but it is based on truth. And the song has four characters in it. The truth is that three of those characters were bishops in England, Protestant bishops. And this was during the rule of Mary Queen of Scots, the Catholic Queen. Of course, she hated the Protestants. And she said that these three Protestant bishops were blind spiritually. So she was going to have them burned at the stake, and she did. And the song we get for the three bishops is Three Blind Mice. <laughs> and the farmer's wife is none other than the Catholic queen, who cut off their tails with a cart. 
Who knew, right? Who knew? So, I thought we could sing Three Blind Mice. <laughs> so we'll just sing one quick version of Three Blind Mice. Three blind mice, three blind mice, see how they run, see how they run. They all ran after the farmer's wife who cut off their tail with a carving knife. Have you ever seen such a sight in your life as three blind mice? <laughs> now the second one is called Hey Ho Nobody Home. Does anyone know that song? Ah, uh, I just I find that a few do. I learned it as a kid. It goes like this: Hey ho, nobody home. Meat nor drink nor money have I none. Yet will I be merry. Hey ho, nobody home. And we used to sing it as a round. Yeah. So if you're familiar with that, that was another one. Did you know it was a Christmas song? <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> I never knew it was a Christmas song until I started researching it for this program. When I thought, oh, they sang that, I know that song. Well, back in England, you used to have wassailers go door to door at Christmas time. And they would knock on your door and they would sing you a little Christmas song, sing you a little, and they would hope that you would give them money uh -huh. and food and drink. And then they would go next to the next house and knock on the door and sing for you and hope that you will give them money and food and drink. And this is how it would go, but sometimes no one was home. And when no one was home and they were walking to the next house, it would be, hey ho, nobody home. Meat nor drink nor money have I none. Yet will I be merry, hey ho, nobody home. So now you know it's a Christmas song and Three Blind Mice has nothing to do with Mother Goose. Thank you for being here today.